Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If they gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Yes, indeed, ladies and gents. It's another episode of Wrestling Changed My Life. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today's a little bit of a unique episode because I get interviewed today. Andre Morgan, who is a huge supporter of the show and has been instrumental in scheduling the Lee Kemp, Bobby Douglas, Tony Davis, and Mario Morgan interviews, he interviews me. And so this takes place down at his home, and I hope you enjoy it. We'll talk to you next week. A lot of big episodes coming next week. Peace! So we are here. Is this Chicago? Andre this Morgan? is Dalton. We're in Dalton, Illinois, right near the, the southern tip of Chicago. I'm going to be interviewed today, folks, because we've heard from a couple of you that you know don't know a lot about me. And so Andre Morgan, one of the big supporters of the podcast, he's brought us some of the biggest interviews we've done. Bobby Douglas, Lee Kemp, Mario Morgan, his son, Tony Davis. Some of the most viewed episodes have been set up by this gentleman here. So it's an honor for me to be here. We're sitting in the trophy room here where... Uh, the accomplishments of Mario are just everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I hear you're not going to be here long. No, we are um, packing up and moving to Beverly Hills, so to speak. We're going to uh, Phoenix, <laughs> Arizona in about two and a half weeks and going to move to the warm weather climate. I, that's good. Well, I appreciate you wanting to do this, and one, for all the help you've done, but two, for wanting to take some time to, to interview me. So, um, Well, you're, you're rapidly becoming famous in the wrestling world. And I guess we can get to that in a little bit. <laughs> but, I, I mean, to chime into your famous, uh, being famous, what's coming up very shortly, I believe, Monday, uh, you've got a big, big interview, or uh, maybe I shouldn't say interview because you're already interviewing, but right. with Dan Gable. Uh, tell me about what you got going on coming up on Monday. Yeah, so the Gable documentary is going live on Monday, and it's a podcast documentary, so okay. it's just audio. And kind of how this all came to be is I've always been a fan of documentaries. And once I started doing the podcast, I'm realizing, all right, I'm interviewing all these wrestlers. And, you know, there's you could take bits and pieces of these interviews and put them into a larger documentary project. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I've kind of for about two years, I've been noodling on this idea of doing some type of podcast documentary on Gable because I figured the podcast documentary is manageable film. It's a whole other thing. Right. That's not my area yet. So I've been noodling on it for about two years, and then this summer I turned 30, and I don't know, something <laughs> got a flame or something. Uh, Three decades. <laughs> something hit, and I go, you know what? I, I've been thinking about this Gable documentary forever. I better pull the trigger on it. And so I remember it was a Sunday night, stayed up till like 2 in the morning, wrote down the outline of it. Of course, that's changed a ton since then. And then I started scheduling interviews, did 18 interviews with – Iowa wrestlers, Oklahoma State guys, announcers, mm -hmm. really anyone who's relevant for that era. And then, you know, did the interview with the big guy, Gable, which has gone live. The full interview's gone live. And then started doing the post production in September and October. So it's been a it's been a journey and uh, learned a lot along the way, but um very excited to get it out. Well when you say Dan Gable, there may possibly be someone listening to this podcast who really doesn't know who Dan Gable is, but he is the the quintessential number one wrestler in America's history of wrestling. Right. I mean, when you say Dan Gable, we're talking wrestling. I, uh, I interviewed him one time on the floor of the 
Northern Illinois Dome, and I was in awe as much as I was interviewing him yeah. because he's a walking legend. Uh, when you were talking with Gable, you know, both times, both the documentary and his initial interview, yeah. what feelings did you get when talking to him? <sighs> Man, nervous, excited, and then after a while, just a, a kind of a calm because you realize that this guy you've looked up to your whole life is as cool and as kind of, he's the real deal, right? He is what you think he is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I grew up an hour away from the University of Iowa, right Right in the middle of Farmtown, USA. Even though it was Illinois, everyone there was Iowa fans. And so growing up, I was obsessed with wrestling and Gable was the, the man, right? And so read everything I could about him. And finally, once I got the interview set up and I got to his house and he showed me around his house, we sat down and I'm... Um, I kind of stumbled a little bit through the first part of the interview, but finally, once we got going, it was just more so a column that, all right, this guy is exactly as you expect him to be. No false advertising, so to speak. So it was a great feeling. Did you make it out to the wrestling mat, the barn, I think it is, that he's got in the back? Yeah, so he's got, yeah, so he's got this cabin in the back that has a sauna and a wood-burning stove in it, and that's kind of his office. Right. And then in his house in the basement, he's got a wrestling room. And that's kind of where his Olympic gold medal's at. It's the museum, as he calls it. So, yeah. Okay. It's, it's oh, got sort of like my museum. Dis- got it. Honestly, <laughs> it's very similar. Um, he's got the real stuff. He's got the real he's got He's got all kinds of memorabilia. I mean, the, the gold medals. And he's got, when he went to the Tbilisi tournament in the Soviet Union, he's mm. got gifts from that. So he's got all kinds of stuff. And, yeah, it was just a real honor. And it was amazing to me how many people stepped up to do the interviews. Like, yeah, you know, like Lincoln McElravey, one of my favorites. Uh, Leroy Smith, John Smith's older brother, stepped up to do it. So I hope it's the first of many documentaries I do. Well, I mean, so many when you read the Gable or you look into Gable's history, some of the stuff that he did that was just legendary is, is amazing. And then I, I talk with uh, Lee Kemp, who yeah. actually beat him yeah. while he while Gable was still fairly competitive. Yep. You know, and and. And they talk about the win against him, but it's so in awe. Uh, I talked to Bobby Douglas, who used to train Gable, and so to speak. And beat on Gable. And beat on Gable. Yeah. But no one else that I have talked to can even talk about the type of stuff. Everybody else is holding him way up there, as they should. Yeah. Um, how long is the document? It's going to be an hour and five, hour and six minutes. I think that'll be a well-spent hour of our lives listening. (laughs) Well, I appreciate that. And that's part one. So that's from, I really wanted to focus it in on not just Gable overall, but have a specific message. And to me, what's most incredible about about Gable is Gable the coach. Because he was the head coach at Iowa for 21 years, and they won 15 national titles in that time. So think about Nick Saban. He's won six or seven. Granted, football is different than wrestling, right. but think about Nick Saban winning 15 in 21 years. You don't you don't hear about well, that. If you just look at who's the number one coach currently right now, it's Gus Sanderson. Yeah. You know, Kale is the guy, and he's not at that level. Not yet. He's he, on his he, way. He's on his way, but, yeah. I mean, didn't Gable do something like win like 10 in a row or something really weird like that where it was like, you're not going to beat this guy. You're, you're, you're really fighting for second place. His coaching legacy is just as stellar as his actual wrestling legacy. I think way, way more even. I mean, I mean, not way more, but wrestling, he was the first back-to-back world champ ever. He won the Worlds in 71 and the Olympics in 72. Then he retired. Then in 76, he came back thinking about going to the Toronto Olympics. That's when Lee Kemp beat him in the Northern mm-hmm. Open. But, you know, John Smith won six in a row. Burroughs has won four or five. So there's more accomplished wrestlers, but coaching never been done before. They won – 21 Big Ten titles in a row. That that's just crazy. That's crazy. And I'm fascinated with coaches and motivators. And so, you know, I'm four to five months into research. I go, all right, I'm gonna angle this like a 30 for 30. Because 30 for 30s, it's not an encyclopedia on whoever the story is. It's a specific angle, right? So the angle to me is Coach Gable. And so part one that's coming out on Monday is essentially from we do some background on his wrestling, but it's essentially from 1978 through 87. Because okay. that's when he, he became the head coach in 76. He got second his first year. Then he won nine in a row, which is what you were alluding to. And then in 87, he was going for 10 in a row, which would have been an all-time record because John Wooden had seven at right, UCLA. Right. And then there's um, like Yale Golf had nine in the 30s, but he was going for 10. It didn't happen, and it got he got beat by Iowa State in his alma mater. So that's where part one ends, and then part two I'm going to release. It's not done yet. But that'll probably be December, January time frame. And that'll be from 
87 through 97 because that's what makes them great is this resurgence because they went five years without winning. Well, we sent the Twisters over there to give him a boost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we sent him Joe Williams and TJ. Yes. And he got a boost from the Twisters, no the Harvey question. Twisters, for my uh, my club. So uh, we pulled him on through through the, through the second half. No so doubt So I'm about sure it. you'll get to that. Oh, yeah. I, I want to interview Joe. And, you know, that's what's, you know, an 88 Arizona State one with Coach mm -hmm. Bobby Douglas, which mm -hmm. to me, that program isn't get enough credit because he, he, Bobby Douglas never won to Iowa State which you would think they're more of a powerhouse than Arizona State, just shows you what he was able to do. What an there. amazing interview that was with Bobby. And and I would encourage people that if they have not heard the podcast, to listen to the one with Bobby. And what I found interesting about it is he talked very little about wrestling. Yes. He talked a lot more about life yep. and, and politics and what was going on at the time. Uh, so I guess it's going to be a two-part interview, I assume, where we'll get you'll get back to him on the wrestling part. Yeah. Or which he was an amazing, fantastic wrestler. Yeah. And uh, I have a great photograph somewhere around here of he did a camp here, and, and my son was, I don't know, 10 years old, and it's got Bobby hugging him. Wow. You know, it, it's uh, just touching these great guys that you've touched in the – how long? You know, first of all, how long have you been doing the podcast? The podcast under the current theme and name has been live a year and a month. So within a year and a month, you have already talked to some of the greatest wrestlers in history. You know, uh, you, you've had a few international, but you've got the national, the American ones. Mm -hmm. And I just think that it's fascinating that in that short amount of time, you've been able to reach these people and really get into that. But I guess getting away from the Gable thing for right now, why wrestling? How did you get into wrestling? And I know you're a wrestler. Wrestler, yeah. You know, I mean, I remember seeing your brother, mm -hmm. and I remember seeing your name. Mm -hmm. But I definitely remember your brother because he wrestled my son. Uh, but why wrestling? Why You could have – I mean, there's lots of sports. Yeah, so it's funny. You know, my dad was always really honest with us as kids because oh. my brother and I were small. My right. brother's 12 months younger than me. His name's Tanner. He's my best friend. We live uh, a mile apart. And so he goes, listen, because we were always involved with sports. We love sports. But mm -hmm. he goes, if you want to excel, you know, I can introduce you to wrestling. I can get you on a weightlifting program. And, if you know, you can take it as far as you want. So Tanner said this to you. My dad. Said Your this dad. To, yeah, my okay. dad said this to Tanner and I. Okay. And because we live with my mom. Was he a wrestler? Who? Your dad. For like a year. So, like in high school, like for like one year, he went out. He was kind of like a burnout type guy. He was in a band. He was a professional musician was his thing. He actually well, opened. That's, that's interesting. That's like me. I wasn't a wrestler. No. I just knew that this would benefit my son. Right. But go ahead. And he, so he, he was actually a musician. So he loved wrestling and he loved sports. Baseball was actually his sport. He coached baseball even when we weren't playing. I like your dad already. I, you guys will get <laughs> along, man. So, and really how it started was. You know, I found a wrestling shoe because I have an older half brother from my dad's first marriage. A red Asics Tiger wrestling shoe. I go, what's this? He explained wrestling. He explained the weight situation mm -hmm. like I just did. So, you know, from kindergarten through fifth grade, we did it 20 matches a year. We were 500. I didn't think about it really much past that. Something happened in fifth, sixth grade where, you know, I just became obsessed with it. And my dad was a big proponent of weightlifting. And so he started doing a summer weightlifting with us at a barbell set. Mm -hmm. Then my mom... Who, that's who we lived with, she knew that we were getting into it, and she knew nothing about it, so she got obsessed with it, and she actually became a certified wrestling referee. Whoa. And so we started doing the whole IKWF circuit, you know, place in IKWF a couple of times. Well, once you're in, you're in, man. You're in, baby. <laughs> There's no getting out. No. <laughs> it's like the mob. It's it. <laughs> and my brother got second at IKWF twice. I he remember lost to that. the same guy and um, Vidim Katz at that uh, program. Uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Me and you both, man. Um, you know, also oh, here's, so I'm thinking of Iowa and Gable. So when I was in seventh grade for my birthday, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. And so my birthday present was May 30, my birthday is May 31st. Mm -hmm. My present was to go to the Iowa camp five days overnight. That's a good present. It was awesome. And like, <laughs> you know, looking back now, kids go to camps all the time now, right. but like we got one a year and that was it. And that, and this is the one we went to is the Iowa well, one. Well, that might be the one that you really need. Exactly. So uh -huh. she takes me to that, you know, Iowa, the mystique starts to set in and, you know, I, you know, just did it every waking second I could, you know, was dedicated towards wrestling from about fifth grade through high school. I, I always say I was good, not great. You know, placed in state in Illinois once, qualified three times. And my brother, like I said, he was better than me. And, you know, eventually, Andre Morgan's a popular man here. 
Sorry. Okay, so you make you're you're all state a couple of years, and then what about college? College, I didn't wrestle in college. So I was I thought about it seriously. I what went, school were you at? I was at uh, what college? Yeah. I started a community college. Okay. And at this point. I was already coaching, so I started a freestyle and Greco club called the Outlaw Wrestling Club. Okay. And that was really just ran from March through July, and we did two practices a week. We brought together the best kids in our area, and by our second year, we had 90 kids in it. And that was my sole job for five years. My brother and I ran that, and that was really where I love discovered the love of coaching. It's probably okay. why I'm so fascinated with coaches now. And so that was really, you know— just a turning point for me because we get to connect with all these kids a lot went on to wrestle d1 and that was a great chapter of my life so that was like the five years after high school tanner and i ran the outlaw wrestling club okay, so till about 25 or so when you started coaching did you ever have to interact with the media or did you ever see media and think about are you looking from afar like i could do that or, you know, so not like, you know it's funny not yet because podcasts weren't even a thing then. But what about just like at state when you go to state and, and you see us doing these interviews? Yeah, did it ever pique your interest? It did. I didn't even cross my mind. But looking back now, what did cross my mind is I was always for staying out with a lot of adults for some reason. Mm -hmm. Like because our parents on Friday and Saturday, my mom and her brother and my grandparents, they'd all sit together and they drink you know mm -hmm. a good amount of beers, and the kids just had to hang out. Okay. We were this there, right? You couldn't – the kids couldn't call their own shots back then. Our fame mm -hmm. was pretty old school. So, like, if the parents are hanging out having some beers, we got to suck it up and hang out. And so I just sat around and really got good at asking questions. So okay. I look back now, I was asking a lot of questions as a kid, and, like, this kind of being okay at having conversations was a skill I learned as a young kid just because our families were always hanging out and I was always around older people. And there is a talent to, in it to get information out of um – people i think so it's a yeah. talent um uh, we had one wrestler on the twisters i won't mention his name because he's a famous wrestler but he was terrible at interviews and all his answers are one and two words you know and and so you could see different reporters getting uncomfortable yeah with this kid who's just not a talker right and it, it happens when you're interviewing people everyone is not going to give you what you want you have to be able to pull that out of them yeah. and that's what i've noticed about you with the podcast is you you kind of got a knack for going with the flow and going with the flow is good because you can kind of control the flow yeah once you get that person comfortable people don't interview well when they're not comfortable it's not their comfort zone and it's not their fault i mean and that's so that all came from it's kind of like this perfect storm right is after I moved so after the Outlaw Wrestling Club, I moved to California mm -hmm. and got into sales. You Out came back here. Okay, I, go know, ahead. I know, right. I know, I know. So ahead. <laughs> I'm living in San Francisco and I'm getting into the world of technology sales. Okay, and so that's where I think kind of the perfect storm of one, just being I'm generally a curious person, and so that's a key part of interviewing people. You have to actually care and be curious, right? You can't be on a script. Mm -hmm. The second thing is, you know, being in sales, and I've probably been at this point you know, a thousand meetings where you sit down with a business, they don't know anything about you, you have 30 minutes to talk to them, and can you build some rapport, build some trust in that 30-minute meeting? And those are some really tough conversations. So I've been in, seriously, probably a thousand of those, you know? And so you think about my experience in sales, having those tough conversations, and then two, actually loving wrestling, the podcast is, it's not easy, but it's fun to do because I'm genuinely interested in whoever I'm talking to. And if for whatever reason they're a little uncomfortable, you can kind of sense that from them and mm -hmm. you, you want to try and match that style so that, you know, you're, you're trying to make them feel comfortable in whatever way you can. And I guess that's how that, that skill came about. See, now I'm amazed at that because I probably failed at every sales job I had. I can only sell things that I'm interested in. So when I think about that and I think about you, you're able to, have success with the podcast because you love wrestling so it's very easy to slide in and talk about things that you love uh if i, I was to say to you why don't you do a podcast on uh, tennis it's not your thing it doesn't mean you couldn't do it but i don't know if you would have the flair and you would get out of it what you're getting out of these podcasts and when i say this i'm speaking as if the people listening today have heard I don't know, maybe 30 of the 60-some-odd podcasts. 74 today, baby. 74. So if you haven't heard 74, you need to get your numbers up. Yeah. Or as they say, get your weight up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 
<laughs> but but regardless, I mean, I, I think that you're having success with these because of your background, yeah. because of your love of wrestling. You know, that that's key. That's key. I mean, and here's the other thing that's probably really tough is that you're not necessarily looking at the person you're interviewing. They may be on a phone call. Uh, uh, 99% of the time, I'm not looking at them. And so <laughs> that's different. Like, you and I, I'm looking at you today. But... But when you're not looking at that person, that and you, so you're just listening, all you got to use is your ears. Mm -hmm. And to pull information out and get those inflections in their voice, that, that's good. I mean, I, I tip my hat to you. I'm, I'm impressed with what you're doing. I appreciate okay? it. And, 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 you know, to be so young and doing it means that you have a future. You I know, hope where, so. Uh, let me ask you, where does this go from here? <sighs> I, I, I think mean, about that a lot. There, but there's another probably 50 people you can interview Yeah. going forward. But where do you go? From when this has run its course, so to speak. So I love interviewing people. So mm -hmm. I do have, I think about the future a lot because I would love to someday make this a full-time gig through a number of capacities that we can talk about. Uh, but essentially, I have a pretty good plan for the next two steps. One is I also grew up loving boxing. My dad okay. loved watching Sugar Ray Leonard, loved watching Tyson. And so even though I never did it, I know a lot about boxing. So... I think boxing and wrestling is similar like that too, where you know, people who are in that world are That's called MMA. Are deep. Well that too. <laughs> yeah, that too, baby. You said boxing and wrestling, that's MMA. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I love that too. That's where you could go with this if you really wanted to, is those MMA interviews. You know, boxing of course, obviously, but you know Well, a lot of those MMA guys have wrestled and so when I look at the potential for the podcast, one, there's some Big interviews I haven't done yet. John Smith, Kale Sanderson. And there, and every year, I try not to interview kids who are in college because I just don't think, you know, if I if someone interviewed me in college, I'd be mortified at what I'd say because I didn't know anything. So mm -hmm. I try to not interview anyone in college. So you figure every year in college, though, a new group of studs graduates. Like when Zahid Valencia graduates, I love to interview him. So right. sometimes I do think that there's going to be a shortage of people to interview. But then I'm like, that's nonsense. There's always mm -hmm. someone. And – we haven't even really tapped into all of the UFC fighters that wrestled, Cormier, Cejudo, all of the politicians, all the business people. You know, so there's a number of avenues just with wrestlers, but with boxers, you know, I was thinking about something like boxing saved my life, right? And not only sticking with that theme of something saved my life, but boxing, they can really grab onto that. And so right. that, and then the third thing is I'm fascinated by what happens to pro athletes when they're retired. And so I'd love to do one something like life after sports where we're interviewing at pro athletes who have retired, talk to them about their life, but then also talk to them. What's it been like afterwards? So sort of like keeping on the same theme as you have now, but just kind of changing the direction, changing the direction. And I would never stop the wrestling one because that's my roots and that's what I love doing. But you know, I used to host a podcast with my best friend. His name's Tom Alamo, but it was called millennial momentum. And we interviewed business leaders to help millennials in the workforce, right? Okay. I enjoyed it because I like interviewing successful people. But one of the interviews we had was Jordan Burroughs. Okay. Which is ironic because I can't get him on my podcast now, and it's a wrestling podcast. But it, well, Is he hard to reach? or He's hard to reach, but that's he's to no avail. Heading into 2020, he's going to be even harder that's to not, reach. Oh, way harder. You may have to show up where he's at. I know. I mean, and uh, have you taken this on the road? I know you went to Gable. Yeah. But – have you thought of just rolling up on a guy? I would love to. So I've thought about it a lot, Andre. And I, the, the only other ones we've done in person was Tom Brands and Gable. That was it. So, but let's say I take a year off of work and just do this full time and live like a live like a monk. I would love to just get like a van and get live a in, Volkswagen yeah, van from the seventies. And I would specifically <laughs> try to do like okay in the winter I'm gonna go down to Florida and do the MMA camp down there because like Steve Mako is mm -hmm. a UFC coach at this gym in Florida. Let's avoid the winners. Maybe come back for like Friday and Saturday to watch the big duels at Oklahoma State or Iowa and then go back to the South. So I'd love to live in a van for a year and just do interviews. It's just a matter of talking my girlfriend into letting me do it. <laughs> two, and then um, and two, you know, making sure that it's sustainable. I mean, have you ever thought about linking up with like maybe a flow wrestling type of deal uh, USA Wrestling, mm -hmm. because what you have already in slightly over a year is a resume. You can you can walk in anywhere and lay it on a table and say, hey, listen to my podcast, and then 
can I call you in a week? And they're going to listen and they're going to go, okay, what can we do to help you? No one's going to say, oh, this is terrible. So have you thought of linking with, uh, and, and, and there's always a price for dancing with the devil. Indeed. And I learned that lesson in the, uh, I'll tell one quick story. When I was the running the Outlaw Wrestling Club, we were having the practices at Rock Island High School in Illinois. Mm-hmm. And one year, the fourth year, we were getting pretty big in the area. The coach of the private school in Davenport, Iowa, said, hey, I'll pay you 500 bucks to have your club at my school. 500 bucks to me was like a million. So I took it. Problem was, though, that all of the Illinois schools were afraid that the private school was going to recruit their kids. So the kids stopped coming. So the high school coaches stopped sending their kids to my club because it was at a private school. So took the money, danced with the devil, it bit me. Looking back now, 500 bucks, I probably spent that on a week and a drinking. You know, who knows, right? Mm-hmm. So there is that dance with the devil. And I've thought about, you know, I, I love flow wrestling. I'm the biggest fan of flow wrestling there is. I think right now I'm very excited to see where the documentary vein goes. Okay. Because I think – I'm just – I can't wait for you guys to listen to it, but there's so many stories that can be told through this documentary lens that I have to get out there. So my plan is – Keep the weekly show going. Wrestling changed my life. Get the documentaries going. So I have like the next three lined up already that I want to do in my head. And I, I have to get approvals from everyone to do it. But, for example, I'd love to do a deep dive on the 88 Arizona State team. Okay. I'd love to do a deep dive on all the UFC fighters that used to wrestle. Whatever, right? John Smith is another example. So I've thought about it, and no one's reached out to me. I have talked to Flo about potentially – you're doing something with them, but it just wasn't the right time for me to move to Austin, Texas, to be quite frank. Yeah, you do have to go down there with them. Yeah. They don't come to you. And I, I'm not opposed to moving, but I'm right now. <laughs> you don't. Ha- you see all these boxes I got packed here? Man, Andre's, You'll get opposed to it. Andre's yeah. getting the hell out of town. We're in Chicago here, and it is the coldest November any of us can remember. Yeah. It is freezing, so Andre's moving to, I can't uh, do it to Arizona. So 50-some years of winners is enough. Unbelievable. But To answer your question, I've thought about it. And I'm not opposed to anyone reaching out. I just it hasn't crossed my my hasn't come across the table yet in that in that form. Which way would be better, them coming to you or you coming to them? So I could go to them, but I'm not as interested in covering every single dual meet that the flow. So the flow guys are wizards because they cover like Cleveland State versus Ohio. Right. That doesn't interest me as much as learning about people's lives. So I feel like the angles are a little bit different. Flow is about current events. USA Wrestling current events, and I am too, but I'm more so focused on talking to Bobby Douglas about what his life was but like in Ohio. I think you Ohio. could sell them on changing what they're doing to some degree. In other words, they still do what they do, but let me provide this little niche here of the history this of extra the sport. Arm, yeah. History, you know. Yep. And, and see, they probably haven't looked at that because you got to believe that everything is dollar and cents. Yep. So they are thinking, okay, how do we sell this? Right. And so you've got to give them their niche so that they can make money. I mean, it's just it, it obviously it would idea. have to be worked and you know reworked and thought about and planned. But it's just an idea, and I saw it in my head. Yeah. And I was just wondering, what do you do from here? But obviously, you've been thinking about that thinking as well. Thinking a lot about it. Yeah. You know, uh, you're nowhere near your end on this run here. Um, I want to talk to you about wrestling changed my life. Mm-hmm. First of all, I think the title is great, <laughs> and I love intro that you have where the clip, you have clips the montage, yeah. and, and I, I got to believe that that was in the early going that you could add on where you could have an end clip with some of the newer ones with something that Douglas said, something that Brand said, something that Mario said, something that Jimmy Kennedy said. I just love that little part of it. How, why, how did you get that name? Because I know you had an original name that you changed. Yeah, so I'll tell you exactly what happened was, so I moved back to Chicago spring of 2018. Mm-hmm. And that's when my roommate, Tom, I go, all right, you're going to keep doing the Millennial Podcast. I'm going to start a wrestling one. So I started out with it being called the Wrestling Mind because I think wrestling forges mental toughness. And I like learning about people's mental tricks, right? What, what are they visualizing? Whatever. But then I realized it was too close to wrestling mindset. And it, the name just wasn't sticking. So for about a month, I was racking my brain on what to call it. I'll never forget. I got back from a road trip to New York for work. I was in my kitchen cutting something and I go shit I should call it wrestling changed my life I stopped what I was doing I ran to my journal wrote down like three pages worth of notes went online bought the domain made sure no one else had to get the domain (laughs) gotta get it and so I um I just go man that is the 
you know, not to tap myself on the back, but that's the best thing I've ever heard for a wrestling podcast. But it's an excellent one. And so, and it just really conveyed what I'm trying to do, right? It's, I want to know about your son. I want to know about Jimmy Kennedy because all these people I grew up knowing, but you don't know anything about their life. So, and, 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 you know, in relationship to the name, it really is something that every wrestler has happened to them. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you always ask them at the end, how did wrestling change your life? And each one has their own unique answer. Yeah. And I listened to that and I kind of, I had to stop myself because a couple of interviews like brands, I just fast forwarded to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I want to hear what he's got to say. Yeah. And then I came back and listened to it. It's sort of like you buy a book and you read the conclusion yeah. before you go through the forward in the actual book. Mm-hmm. And so I, I've been, but I've been, I haven't been doing that lately. I've been like hanging in there, uh, forcing myself to, Wait on it because it's like it's coming. I know it's coming. What may? How, what? Did, how did this impact these guys? Yeah. And you know, I just thought that's a great hook. Thank you. you. Know, it, it's a great hook. Um, well, question. Then, just to answer your question about the montage at the beginning. So that you know, the the opening song used to be something else, but then I realized about thirty five episodes in, I go, man, I've asked thirty five people how to wrestling change your life. So I just went and found what I thought were the most compelling ones that fit together. So it's like, you know, Corey Jansen, Sean Borme, Sean Charles. And I just wove them in. It just, I need to redo it. I've just been so consumed no. with the people. Dying. You don't think so? No, just add on to add it. Add on to it. Or, okay. or, or put one at the end. Yeah. You could. You oh, an outro. Yes. I could do an outro song. Do an outro with the, with the, with the newer ones. Yeah. I'm telling you, you got some great ones. Well, the ones now, I mean, the Bobby Douglas one, I get chills thinking about it. You know, Gable, yeah, Kerry McCoy, even. Put those so on the guys. backside. Yeah. The, the, the front is perfect. See, so what I found out about things in life is that if it's not broke, don't, don't fix it. it. Amen. Because yeah. you 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 hit it right, I think. My opinion, I think it's right. And um, I always listen to it, even though I know what they're going to say. <laughs> yeah. Does that, I don't know if that makes sense. I actually but. wonder if people do that, because sometimes when I listen I to do. podcasts, I fast forward through all the opening stuff, but I hope not, because I, I do enjoy that But part. it's compelling. I think it is. It's compelling. Yeah. So don't t- – my hey, I won't change Everybody it, that's listening to the podcast, chime in <laughs> and let him know whether he should change the intro or not. I vote no. <laughs> right, now, that's one vote for no. We'll see what the public says. For but sure. But definitely do an outro. That's a great idea. You know, yeah. because you kind of just end with that question, how did wrestling change your life? And then, boom, and then all it's of a sudden, over. it fades right into Dalton Bullard. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's cool. Yeah. But try it out. Just a suggestion. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Now, you've interviewed how many people now? We've published 74. I probably have five or six in the queue. Okay. So, so probably call it 80. All right. So, I got some questions for you. Who is your favorite one to do? And this is no offense to anybody else that doesn't make the that don't make the cut. Okay. But your favorite one that you did. The first one that's coming to mind, there's two. Okay. Is one. Um, the first one was Chris Perry. Okay. And I'll tell you why is that was the first time I had a, a someone on the podcast where I thought, okay, this guy is actually interested in the podcast. Like, I think he had listened to one or two before that. And okay. to me, that was unbelievable that a college coach was doing that. So that was a big one. And I thought he, he was just very open and his story was fun. Okay. And afterwards, he's like, hey, I can introduce you to these three people. Like, he was, like, invested and he really liked it. So that was one for sure. The second one that's coming to mind, God, I feel so bad saying it because there's just been so many. But, you know, some of the early ones mean a lot because no one knew anything about the show then. Okay. And so – couple that come to mind are jesse jansen who was na- won a national title for harvard he and he runs beat the streets he's like the main guy in it he did it jeff buxton because he did it early but then recently i would say bobby douglas and tom brands the gable one was great but i knew so much about him but tom brands surprised me because he was somewhat it seemed different than what you think like you see him on tv you think he's kind of crazed man crazy man but he was even like when he was showing me around his office he couldn't have been nicer. Mm-hmm. And then um, Bobby Douglas, because he was so open about oh, a lot of hardships. Was he open? Man, yeah. that was cool. Um, God, it's just – and then Nate Carr hasn't been released yet, but Nate Carr Sr., that was a great one. Okay. And he had 13 brothers. 
or 13 brothers and sisters, like five were all Americans, and you just find so many different things about people you had no idea. Okay, so you know, so who was the hardest to interview? And when I say hard, you know, just you just had to work. I had to work. Okay. Um, I would say, honestly, the Bobby Douglas one because he paused so long in between what he said is. You know, as an interviewer over the phone, I have kind of a rule in my head where I don't talk until I count to two in my head. Because sometimes you jump in and they're not done because you can't see their expressions, right? Mm -hmm. So in my head when I'm on the phone, if someone stops talking, I count to two. And if they're done, then I'll jump in, right? Bobby was, he paused a long time and he's just, you know, so he was taking his time. He's thinking about it. He's thinking about it. And so that was a challenging one because, you know, I didn't, I don't think he even knows what a podcast is, but he was so he doesn't know. And, but he was so, you know, open to doing it. But that was one where I was nervous um, and I felt challenged. And then another another one was, honestly, anytime they're in person, you got to work for it because it's just there's no notes to look at. Not that I usually look at notes, but mm. the in person ones, uh, G- Gable and Brands were tough because you're looking right across from them, and if you want to think of a question you wrote down, you can't. So. Those come to mind. I mean, honestly, it, it feel bad singling out any episodes because they've all been. They've all been great. I get so excited for all. I mean, if I don't get excited for it when I'm thinking about it in my head, I don't even reach out to them. Right. So anyone I reach out to, and not that I get everyone I reach out to, I don't. There's a lot who I haven't. But if I reach out to them, I just as excited as just as excited as any of them. And like the morning of, I'm so jacked to get the interview going that it's just it's hard to describe. And then afterwards. You know, think about if you if you or I happen to meet, you know, I don't know, like John Wood, and like you're gonna be fired up for about a good hour, two hours afterwards. That's how I feel every time after I do an interview. Okay. And so selfishly, I'm getting as much out of this as anyone. You know, to be totally honest with you. So going with that theme, what's been the most personal, rewarding one? Which one do you think has been like really not well personal and rewarding, but also rewarding to the wrestling community? told a story that maybe they didn't know okay man and that you didn't know so there's two that come to mind the first one is tony davis because what he went through his senior year where he did not he did not go to high school Mm -hmm. he was involved with gang violence got shot and then really was rescued and saved by wrestling because he was in the hospital the summer what would have been going into his freshman year in high school he was in the hospital because of a broken jaw and iowa central community college called through milton blakely and they go, hey. Cousin of the family. I didn't know that until yeah. today. Yeah, he's family. And so Milton was being recruited, and he goes, hey, you got to get Tony Davis. And so Iowa Central calls Tony Davis in the hospital and goes, hey, forget about your past. We know you're a great wrestler. Come on board. And that changed his life. And then he you know, won a national title, Iowa Central, won a national title, at UNI. So that's one that really I got a lot of feedback on. The second one, and this makes – Surprised a lot of people, and even you, is I don't know if you listened to the Lee Roper one. I didn't. So he is a coach at UNI, and he's an incredible story because he wrestled at Appalachian State, national, maybe a national qualifier, nothing exceptional, right, wrestling-wise. Then his he had some personal relationship issues, and he really went in-depth on that podcast about the str- – he was in a struggle for like a year, right, a struggle within himself to get himself motivated again. And so, you know, that – really stuck to me because Lee opened up a lot about it and you know I like when people are vulnerable because no matter who you are you've been in a low spot and Lee opened up about it and he goes hey what saved me was coaching wrestling and he started you know coaching a kids club and that got him excited about life again forget about getting excited about himself he got excited about life again because he had a purpose and so I just remember doing that interview with Lee and I didn't know a lot about him before it I just knew that he was really respected in the wrestling world and I go Man, that was awesome because it connected with me a lot. And okay. so that was one where I just felt that I felt good for maybe eight hours afterwards as opposed to two. Well, what I like is, um, and the very first one I listened to was Jimmy Kennedy, is I learned something about a person who I thought I knew about, but I didn't know everything about him. So I learned something about him. Uh, I like to think that the one with my son who has received... One of the top 15 most downloaded ever. Is it? Yes, sir. Okay. See, I think that he presented a side of himself because he's kind of a quiet guy that people didn't know. He wasn't a showboat wrestler, per se, after the match. But during the match, he had a flair. I think people learned his personality, who he is. 
uh, uh, brands. You know, like you said, it, it, it just shows a side of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bobby Douglas, I didn't learn a lot about his wrestling, but I learned a whole lot about his life. So I think or about Eastern Europe at that know, time. Well, it's like holy shit, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the stuff that I learned was it increased my knowledge of the sport. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, going forward. Yeah, going forward into the future, uh, I want you to tell me. Well, we'll start small. Give me three must-have interviews. Whether you get them or not. Three John S- John Smith. John Smith. Kale Sanderson. Kale Sanderson. Daniel Cormier. Daniel. That's three must-haves. So, right now, wrestling family, if you have their phone numbers, I need you to email <laughs> Ryan. What's your email, Ryan, so we can get these numbers for you? Ryan Nicholas Warner at gmail.com. Go okay. to the website. Everything's on there. WrestlingChangeMyLife.com. Okay, so that's three must-have interviews. Yep. Um, give me three that you're working on now. You haven't locked them in, but you're in negotiations with that. They might be coming sooner than later. Mike Poeta. Oh, wow. DJ Futrell. Woo, Carmel. Talked to, talk to him this morning. Excellent. Let's see who's another one that I've, I'm going back and forth with. Um, they're on the cooker, but they're not in yet. Jamil Kelly. Jamil Kelly. Yeah, we've talked, and it's going to happen sometime in the next couple of weeks. Just schedules work out. You know, sometimes it takes months to get someone locked in. Okay. Now, these are all wrestlers that you've named. Yeah. I'm going to need three coaches you're trying to get. Hmm. Okay. Brian Snyder, Nebraska. Okay. Uh, Coach Quint. Harvey Twisters, he's dot. You're ducking and dodging me on him. Uh, I talked to BJ a day, and he goes, "That's gonna be tough." Right? Well, see, he's I go, telling you what I told you. But it's oh, so hey, that'll be a guy you'll have to roll up on. We're gonna go together. Oh, we'll no. roll up together. I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna throw you under the bus all on right, that one. Right, you got to December sixth. So <laughs> he uh, explain a little bit about who he is, real okay. quick, Andre, just so the folks know who is Coach Quint. Quint Troy Harrell, who I feel, and a lot of other people feel, is the most influential coach in Illinois over the last 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. He's the head coach of the Harvey Twisters. Mm-hmm. He's produced numerous national champs, All-Americans, Olympians. Uh, I won't even bore you with the names, uh, but if you know anything. I will. Else, Joe uh, Williams, TJ Williams, Tony Davis, Mario Morgan, Charles Lloyd, Milton Blankley. I mean, it just it, it goes on and on. Unbelievable. You know? And it's one small pro- – it's not a club that recruits. Like, now there's these academies. They don't do that. This is a small little – Hole in the wall, essentially. Oh yeah, yeah. We we had one field house in a park district. Yeah, I'm waiting for my Harvey yeah. Twister shirt. All those Harvey Twisters I've had. On. Oh man, <laughs> you, you had to come in a room and wrestle for that one. Man, they don't. They <laughs> we don't give our stuff they out like that. They don't, man. They don't. I, I love I, that. I heard Mario tell you he couldn't give you all the secrets. He couldn't. I know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Coach Quint would be one for sure. Okay. And I'm gonna give you another surprise one who. I think also touch a lot of people in Illinois. Jose Martinez. Jose Martinez. The old man. I mean, he. A little controversial, and I like that about him, but he, a lot of it when he started was at West Aurora High School, you know, just doing basic stuff. So, I, you know, I think IKWF, the Illinois Kids Wrestling Federation, is the premier 7th and 8th grade circuit. We, oh. know, we know the best high school is PA in Ohio, but the best middle school circuit to me is IKWF. Oh, you, it, it's a meat grinder. You get one of those bracket boards Look like at that, that one there? Look at that bad boy. <laughs> As a kid, that thing looked 10 foot tall, man. Yeah, man, hey, it's the it's the best frame I got in my house. But to get one of those boards, you, you got to put in work. Um, it's intense, yeah. Uh, okay, so we got those guys. I'm gonna, I, I, I got to insist you get my guy, Mike Denny. Mike Denny. And that, gotta, actually, that he got to be number time. four. He's got to be on the list because he's a great, great coach. And I'm going to give you another one. You're, you're in the family with this guy, but he is one of my favorite interviews. He is a who do we got interview king, and that's Izzy Style Israel Martinez. Man, you got to interview him, and because this guy's been, you know, he's just he's he's the he's the ultimate entrepreneur of wrestling. A, yeah, yeah, he makes his own way. He's a hustler. Hustle. I love hustlers. And and I like people who are like but, again a little edgy like that. He's an edgy guy. Edgy. Oh, you know, I mean, he's all over the place. You could turn on Oregon, and he's standing on the sideline. Or he's you go, everywhere. He's MMA. He's coaching there. You got to interview Izzy if you need need a hook up with him. I got you. I do need a hook up with him oh, because easy. he, uh, you know, for the folks who don't know, Izzy. Anytime John Jones fights, he's in his corner. He was at the Ohio State duel last week. He's at he's everywhere. Three worlds. I don't even know where he lives. So uh, he would be an outstanding. He, he got married, but it didn't slow him down. He's still <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> or maybe, maybe you could put all three of those guys together: Jose, the father, Nathan, and Israel. See, that's what, I like the idea of the roundtables. That's yeah. why I told BJ today. Is I go, BJ, 
Futurell, that is. Let's get you, Mario, and Tony Davis with Coach Quint round table. Wow. Let's get it on history before you know, some of these guys are getting old. Well, Quint definitely is headed towards the retiring stage. So I think the round table idea is something I'd like to do more of. And the Martinez round table, could you imagine? Oh, that'd be awesome. I'd listen. I would too. <laughs> I'd listen. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the whole thing I do. It's like, I mean, I like to. S- from the Twister's point of view, uh, Jose Martinez is very well respected. Yeah. From our, from our end. Um, just is. Yeah. He just, he's just respected. And as he's, I was saying that, I didn't I know. I can tell some stories, but I won't because it might offend other people. But is he? I mean, not is he, but Jose is just a great, great guy for us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this one's going to be tough. Okay. I've yet to hear, and maybe I've missed it, out of 74-some podcasts, I haven't heard any of the women. We have had one woman, and it's been Nancy Schultz. The, the wife of late Dave Schultz. So we've had that one. And it's a great point. It's not without fail. I've tried. I've reached out to a couple. I, uh, specifically, Adeline Gray. You know, we're still, you know, didn't get, didn't get back to me. That's okay. But Victoria Anthony is a, is a lightweight wrestler. She's going to be coming on after the Bill Farrell. So I've exchanged some emails with her or Instagram messages with her. But I'm ashamed of it, Andre. I am because the f- women are the future of wrestling. Well, and wrestling is becoming huge in the women's ranks. They've got a spot in the, in the sport, and we've got to help them. And, and the basis of men's programs being reinstated will only happen if there's a women's program as well. right? Title IX, we all know, was passed in 1972, had great benefits for women. It was absolutely detrimental for men's wrestling, men's swimming, men's whatever. Some niche sports. 460 programs have been cut since 1972. 460. Wow. So you think there's less than 100 Division One programs now. There used to be wrestling at UCLA, Florida. So when you talk to Coach Denny, you'll definitely get an opportunity to talk to him about a program that was at the top. UNO. There were three programs that were at the top. There, there's, there's Iowa. There was uh, Wartburg, Wartburg. And then there was Nebraska Omaha. Back at this time. He, he yeah. only refers to now as the other place. Right. So you'll get a chance to talk about. And, that, and that's a good thing to, to interview about is yeah. the closing. And now we've got. Schools getting teams again. Schools are opening. I've, so in the past 20 years, I think that's like 27 schools have been added. A lot at the NAIA level. Not And there's been a couple at D1, but real small programs. But, and I've heard this from a number of people, the only way we're going to get programs added at like Texas, where there's a huge club presence, is if there's a women's program too. And so call the University of Nebraska and ask for Trev Alberts, athletic director, and ask him why he cut – Wrestling at Nebraska Omaha. I heard that guy is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you get that interview, boy. Your your numbers will go up through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike Denny's a guy who we've. Uh, you know, that's on me. We've exchanged calls. We had something scheduled. It just didn't work out. But he, we're, I'm going to get him back on. Hopefully, with the next couple of weeks, because what he did at University of Nebraska Omaha, unbelievable. They win the nationals ten years ago. They cut the program the next day. Didn't even give him a phone call. You well, know, essentially. Well, they cut it that night. The night of the national night, championship. The night of winning the national title. But that's a long, different story. Yeah. Um, so we got the women on the docket. Women on the docket. We, we, we've got some of the greatest coming, and we've already had some great ones. Yep. Um, what about going down a notch? Yep. Because I, when I think about who you've had, you've had cream of the crop. Yep. But there are guys that I think of that maybe they weren't a national champion. Maybe they weren't an All-American, maybe they wrestled through high school and then just went straight academic, but they were great. Yep. Um, uh, I'll just throw a name out there just off the cl- top of my head. Uh, Ryan Prater. <sighs> know that guy real well. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. He'd be a good interview. Great uh, interview. You mentioned another guy here, uh, Steve Zimmerman. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'd throw out there Christian Brantley. What about Keith Healy? Keith yep. Healy. Yeah. The first, the first four-time – Lawless Award winner out of the Chicago Catholic League. Uh, that's that award right there. So he's a four-timer out of the Chicago Catholic four-time League. Four-time Lawless winner? Uh, four-time Catholic League. Okay, a four-time got him the Lawless Award. Gotcha. Uh, but, yeah, Keith Healy, who's the driving force in a lot of ways, not solely, but a lot of ways behind IKWF. Oh, yeah. So there's there's guys that they don't have the statue of a Joe Williams or Cormier or whatever, or whatever yeah. but they are still wrestling Changed their life. Jim Constantine. Yep. Yep. And I tell you what, that's something where 
I can't forget about that and because sometimes it's, you know, I get a little tied up in making sure the numbers are good and always growing, but it's like take the ego out of it. It's about the story because people listen to the story. Like there's enough listeners now that listen every single week no matter what. It doesn't matter who you put out there. As right, long as it's, it's a subscribe. good story. It comes up on my screen. Right. So Ooh, There's a new one. Go to SoundCloud. Why, you know, we're talking earlier about will we ever run out of people? No, because there's so many stories. I had a guy on yesterday. His name's David Katz. Mm-hmm. He's at a, He lives in Israel, wrestled for two years in high school. He's a rabbi in Jerusalem, of all places. I interviewed this guy. He, uh, I did. I'm already in his wrestling. Oh, so he, he listens. He goes, hey, I got a great story. I go, what is it? He's like, I was up to 285. I'm down to 160 because I got back to my wrestling roots. I'll show you the picture. Wow. So he essentially, you know, like a lot of, like a lot of people, after high school, went to school, started eating unhealthy, and then and he became a rabbi in Israel, and, you know, health wasn't really a you know, diet and working out wasn't really a thing then. And then in like 2010, Flo came around. So he started watching it again through the internet. And he's like, oh yeah, he's remembering his wrestling roots. And he's starting to question himself. Why did he quit so early? And so, because he didn't wrestle out of high school. He only wrestled two years in high school. So now 2018 rolls around. He's still way overweight. He kind of tells himself, hey, I can never go back in time and wrestle again, but I can kind of forgive myself for that by getting back in shape. And so he went to the gym June of 2018 wearing wrestling shoes and an Iowa wrestling shirt in Jerusalem, started eating right, and had lost 110 pounds within eight months. And he still works out to this day. See, those are stories that can be told. Right. They need to be told. Yep. Uh, I've got one more that I thought of, but I, it's kind of a stretch. But if you think about it, especially going to kids' tournaments, there's always that one mom Mm-hmm. She's usually on the front banister of the upper balcony of the bleachers or at the side of the mat, and she's screaming. You're not talking about Gail Rush, are you? <laughs> <laughs> or my well, mom, well, for Gail example. Gail Rush was very knowledgeable about the sport. Very knowledgeable. By the way, you need to interview Clayton Rush. I saw One you of had my his best coach. friends. Yeah. I saw you had his coach, Clayton Rush, a D3 NCAA stud. National. You've got to interview Clayton Rush. I actually did on the old one, and it didn't convert over to the new one. So well, I do got to redo that. Yeah, you got to right. redo Clayton Rush. I should do my mom and Gail, because my mom, you know, wrestling certified. Kathy rough. Schultz. Okay. Mark Schultz's mom. Okay. You got the see moms, even my own wife who will never do an interview. They but put up with a lot. But they, their role in this sport. So you may have to use several moms to get the point across in one story. It's a great point because I've had a but rule that you have to wrestle. Like maybe I should change that rule. All the stuff that's in this room. I would have we would have not got any of this without my wife. Right. Because she's the one that shook that kid at four thirty in the morning to get up to go weigh in at seven. Right. Uh she washed the singlets. Right. Okay. She made the cooler. Right. You know, there's a couple of the coolers we use right there. Yep. She 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 did all that. She was the backbone. And I tell you, my mom, she used to she used to eat what we ate when we were cutting weight. And so she would she would cook meals according to what we needed to cut weight. So all those years, she did that same thing. And, yeah, I mean, I know my mom listened, so got love for you, Mama Jay. <laughs> you you <laughs> got to. Uh, gotta, they're I mean, influential. They're, they're, they may not give you an hour's worth of stuff, or they may. But if you put two or three of them together. Now, the round table idea. I, I, I'm just saying, I, I would listen. Yeah, me you too. You had four moms in here? Yeah. I mean, I would listen because they're the backbone of the sport. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, we can go get daddy coach. That's easy, you know, but mom, mm-hmm. you know, she's the one. She's the one that kept it together, that filled the water bottles, that made the sandwiches, that did all of that. Mm-hmm. So you got to get her uh, just big time. I think I think that grows because all these people are part of wrestling. Yeah. Cha- that changed their lives. No question. Of- My wife didn't know diddly winks about wrestling. Right. But she's she can tell you a takedown. She can tell you every. She can tell you moves. Mm-hmm. You know, they learn. Oh yeah, and they need to be included in this. That's I a, think oh, that's a great point, and I never even thought about that because, man, my mom to this day is a wrestling nut. She watches it just like you know as much as not as much as I do, but more than a lot of guys I know. I tell you that you know. So I don't know. That's a great point. Getting some, uh, I mean, get some of the moms on. Why not a, slip a couple of them in? Flip the script. Yeah. Uh, one more person that can really add to this, I think that you got to find, there, there's a few refs. Mm. You know, yeah, that other guy, the guy in stripes. Mm. But you know what? There's a lot of good ones out there. They're, they're, they're a part of the sport. Yeah. They are a part of the sport. And I think that the top ones, 
I don't even want to, I hate to use the word top, but just there's a couple of guys, and maybe you'd have to get suggestions on who to interview. Yeah. But I know from my interviews at high school state, they love to talk. Yeah. They love to tell you because a referee is generally misunderstood. How long have you been a ref for? 22 years. And what, what, what levels and what sports? Um, college baseball, high school football, uh, high school and grammar school basketball. Okay. Um, and I think that they have a story to be told, too. Mm -hmm. It's not all the wrestler's not always right. The coach isn't always right. Right. He's not always wrong either. Right. I would just like to hear a couple of referees. And I, I say this because I know of a ref that's done a lot of high school matches and he's not at his best health. And uh, uh, I like to get his story told. Uh, and they're doing it in another venue. Uh, he's getting an award this winter. Mm. But we're losing guys. There's a shortage of referees. Is and there? Then, yeah. Oh, there's without a doubt. Really? Well, Think about it. Would you like to go and put on a striped shirt and be yelled at for five hours at an IKWF tournament? I did it when I was in college for some for some beer money, but that was about it. <laughs> right. Well, these guys are professionals. I know. Real professionals. They go yeah. out every week, and they do it for the sport because they love the sport, too. And most of them, 90% of them are former wrestlers. Oh, most, yeah. And they so just want to be around it. They want to stay in the sport, and right. they don't want to coach. Right. Coaching is a huge, huge It's job. a grind. Grind. Wrestling is... A grind. Even as a referee, it's kind of a grind, but it's a different kind. Right. But I'll tell you what, you can't have a wrestling match without a referee. Right. Try it. It'll be impossible. Mm -hmm. So they deserve, I mean, a little niche. And there's another la another niche, too, is Sandy Stevens, who's the announcer. I was getting to her. She has to be on. That's my girl. And so I'd love to have her on. I mean, as we're talking. She's a legend. A legend. It's really I'm is. trying to grow up and be like her. <laughs> well, you're on your way. You're going to go announce a football game tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, as we're talking, you know, I'm just getting more and more excited to get back out there because about two weeks ago, I had a two day lull where I was just kind of thinking, man, what am I going to, who am I going to keep interviewing? Like, I'm thinking about all the Big Ten schools. I'm checking off coaches. So, but as we're talking, there's more. Like, get off the pity part. Let's get back out there. There's Let's coach, get back on there's the streets. There's coaches. There's moms. There's, uh, Kit level legends. Oh yeah, so m you could do. Yeah, I mean, three hundred episodes just on IKWF. <laughs> oh yeah, easy. Yeah, you know, there's some characters in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> no question. Um, so as we get ready to wrap up here, yeah. I've just got to do it. I've got. I, I from the moment I first heard it, I always wanted to do it. Tell us how wrestling has changed your life. Absolutely, wrestling has changed my life because.
state champs, the ones who were, they were 500, but after they started working with us for a year, they went seven, you know, they won 70% of their matches. Those kids that made those kind of jumps, those are the ones that probably, that's where the biggest impact was because one, you know, they weren't getting a lot of love. They weren't getting someone that cared about them before that. And so once you show someone, you know, and all coaches do this, I'm not special, but I think coaches at the youth and the high school level, and I just happen to do that, that's where you can make the big impact. Because again, I mean, I can count tons of kids where they were 500, had no confidence or a little overweight. And then after two years of working with, just happened to be me, but working with my brother and I, they're, they're built. They got a nice looking girlfriend. They're feeling good about themselves. And to this day, we have a relationship. So that that's where I really give back more so than any other thing I've done in wrestling was through the coaching. And all great things must come to an end. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, give us a review, give us a rating, and share this with your friends. It would mean the world to us. Thanks for listening to Wrestling Changed My Life.